Um, hello, and welcome to Keep Middlesex Moving webinar series. I'm Christina Fowler, your host. For those of you not familiar with KMM, we are the Transportation Management Association for Middlesex County. We work with employers, local and state government agencies to promote programs aimed at traffic mitigation, sustainability, and economic development. To learn more about us, please visit us at kmm.org or shoot me an email. Before we begin today's webinar, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping details. At the end of our webinar, we will be taking questions. To ask a question, please use the Q&A feature on your screens. If you are tuning in from Facebook, please place your question in the comments below. This webinar will be recorded and can be sent to you along with the presentation at your request. I'm now gonna turn it over to Bill Neary, our executive director. Thank you, Christina. I wanna welcome everyone. This is part of a series we've been having for the past year or two concerning electric vehicles and reducing the air pollution that we have in New Jersey through a variety of different sources. We're fortunate today to have Melissa Ivanego, who's working with the Department of Environmental Protection on a very important thing with the reggie gases and how we can reduce the carbon or reduce our carbon footprint with diesel engines by being replaced with more cleaner fuel uh, properties. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting topic. Municipalities with their fleets can learn a lot of information and do a lot of good for their own communities. I'm gonna pass it off to you, Melissa. You can introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and tell us a little bit how you think the state is gonna be moving in the right direction with your programs. Uh, thanks, Bill. Hi, I'm Melissa Evanego. I'm the manager of the Bureau of Mobile Sources here at New Jersey uh, Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so as you all know, climate change is um, a very hot topic. It is one of great importance to the Governor Murphy administration. Um, there's a lot of transportation initiatives that are taking place um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The REGI uh, program, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, is just one um, program, one of the programs that we are focusing dollars to electrification of vehicles. Um, so it's been really exciting for us to be able to be involved in this movement to electrification. Um, we get to understand what the new offerings are. We get to see these projects in the works um, and understand where the hiccups are along the way. Um, thanks to Keep Middlesex Moving for providing me this opportunity to, to be able to present, to be able to answer questions um, about this current solicitation. Um, I know it gets confusing. There's lots of agencies that have money and they're giving them out. Sometimes um, the grant requirements are very different from agency to agency. So opportunities just to talk and have some real dialogue back and forth, um, I think would be very helpful to you all as well as to us um, to kind of streamline and funnel the questions because everybody seems to have you know, very similar questions. Um, so this is really um, a great opportunity to do that. I've been with the department for 24 years. Most of my um, time has been in the mobile source world, but I did spend some um, first about nine years of my career in stationary sources, but I've worked in the air program the whole time. Um, and like I said, this is a very exciting time to be in the transportation world. Um, so I think I'm just gonna kick that off and I'll share my screen uh, for the presentation. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Uh, one of the things you should know also, Melissa, as, as a Transportation Management Association, we're one of eight that covers the entire state. The state okay. of New Jersey is the only state that has a TMA in every county. So I think uh, the, the possibility to spread this out will be even bigger if we can get this uh, thing rolling. So I appreciate your PowerPoint's gonna really give us some really detailed information that we need. Yeah, uh, I think helpful for many people and many friends. So <laughs> thank you. Okay, so. Um, okay, I don't need my notes. Let me see, I'm not sure how to get that off. Can you see my notes or you just see the presentation? Your notes say, what is Reggie? Yeah, I mean, that's just the next slide. So I'm not really sure how to get that off. Melissa, I don't see your notes. You're fine. Okay. okay. So any, okay. So I'll just go ahead. I put some extra slides in here um, just for reference. If you use this PowerPoint and you post it somewhere, I'm not gonna necessarily go through all the ins and outs of Reggie. Um, 
but I just wanted to show, um, so what is Reggie? It's a cap and uh, reduce CO2 program. And it's one of the tools that we have to reduce um, carbon dioxide. New Jersey is one of the 11 states. We re-entered Reggie in 2019 with the first auctions happening in 2020. Um, so this is a good source of funding for us to use for grant programs. Um, I'll just leave this as a resource uh, page, but I wanted to go over the funding. So um, the Global Warming Solutions Fund Act specifies what, um, how the Reggie funds get allocated. So the three different agencies in New Jersey is the EDA, Economic Development Authority, BPU, which is the Board of Public Utilities, and then the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection. So this is how the funding is split for Reggie. EDA gets 60%, BPU gets 20%, and then DEP gets 20%, but it's split into two pots, 10% for lo local government and 10% for what we consider like the sequestration part of the house. What I'm going to talk about in our funding is that 10% for local government. So that's really important. So when you see, you know, any headlines on the auctions or how much New Jersey has brought in, remember there's just a very small sliver that um, we here at DEP for local government projects um, get. In the past, uh, BPU's funding of 20%, we have used to um, spend on projects because of the VW fund and because of a lot of the other voluntary um, grant programs that we have done for a long time, we get a lot of projects in. A lot of the projects are very useful, they're very meaningful, and because of that, we were able to use the BPU Reggie funds for our last couple of solicitations. Um, you know, moving forward, I don't know if that will be the case. This solicitation is just for our lane, the 10% for local government, um, so I just wanted to be clear um, because some of the questions that we have gotten are, you know, the last time you, you did funding, you funded private industry. You know, why aren't you doing that now? And so this is really to answer that question, that we do have very distinct lanes of where it, the agencies can spend their money. Okay, so the strategic funding plan is a plan that lasts for, um, that's updated every three years. And this is the at first plan um, identified that this is how we were going to spend, you know, the transportation funds um, through these four initiatives. We're in the process of starting to have conversations on what the next funding plan will look like and what the focus will be on. But here is what, um, what we're working with now. And then as, of everybody, as everybody saw, um, we did come out with our latest solicitation, our call for projects on February 1st. Um, this solicitation will be open for one month. Um, and again, this is for projects in the DEP spending lane. So that's for local governments. Um, it could be any local government vehicle. Um, you know, we specify shuttles and school buses and garbage trucks and things like that, because that's where the big movement, that's where the big transition from diesel to electric has occurred. There's a lot of vehicle offerings um, in that space, but any local government um, vehicle is eligible as long as there's an electric component to that. Um, we also allow privately owned um, school bus contracts. So a lot of school districts uh, partner with a private uh, bus company for their buses, and those privately owned school buses are allowed to submit an application during the solicitation as long as they have a contract with the public school district. Um, the grant pays for 100% of the incremental cost to an electric vehicle, plus all the charging infrastructure that's applied. So if a brand new diesel, say, uh, truck costs $100,000 and the new electric vehicle costs $300,000, our grants would cover 
the difference between the new diesel and the electric. So in this case, it would be 200,000 plus the associated charging infrastructure. Um, one of the other things that we require is telematics. Um, a lot of new, the new electric vehicle as offer telematics as part of the price of the vehicle. If not, um, the state will provide a telematics device and this device needs to be on the vehicle for up to three years. This telematics really, you know, that what we're looking to gain from the information of a telematics, it's a little device that goes, gets plugged into the OBD port. And we really just want to make sure that the vehicle is operating the way it's supposed to be, you know, that the vehicle's charging or how is it um, receiving the charge. And all these funds for electrification, you know, as part of a larger pilot program. We want to understand how these vehicles are operating. How are people using them? Are we gain, Are we getting all the mission benefits um, that we were hoping to get? Um, again, this is a new technology. You know, maybe some applications are are better than others. You know, is a certain garbage truck getting the benefits, is it operating the way it was supposed to be rather than, you know, a different type of garbage trucks or um, school buses, you know, how is it working on the, um, the routes that are working up north where it might be more mountainous or colder versus South Jersey buses. So that's the telematics will help give us some analytics as to how the vehicles are operating. You know, we're not interested in finding out, you know, where these buses are going or, um, how much they're used, you know, we are obviously interested in these vehicles getting the most amount of time and we do want them to be operated, um, you know, the best that uh, a district can use them. Um, but, you know, we're not trying to be big brother and tell you how to use your vehicles when you use your vehicles, um, but we're really more interested in the technology and how the vehicles are performing. So that's the point of the telematics. Um, and then when we look at these projects that come in, the priorities will be given to projects that are in overburdened communities and that obtain the best greenhouse gas um, cost effectiveness. So those are some of the things that um, we'll be thinking about when we're scoring these projects. So, you know, to me, that's, you know, simple. There's not a whole lot of requirements. Oh, the one thing I should note is that we do um, require scrappage. So that old vehicle that you're getting rid of does have to be um, decommissioned. It has to be rendered inoperable. Um, that means drilling a hole, a three inch hole in the engine block. That means cutting the chassis. Uh, we just wanna make sure that this vehicle doesn't go to somewhere else, whether it's in state, out of state, um, we wanna make sure that the benefits that we're getting as part of this project are true benefits. Um, and we wouldn't get that if the old vehicle was not decommissioned. Melissa, will the municipality also be benefited by having uh, maintenance reports also to see if the redu reduction of maintenance could be another uh, advantage to having these type of vehicles? Would that be part of a program or no? I mean, obviously we will take any success stories um, that are part of um, any of our programs. And we've heard, you know, a lot of that in some of the other projects. Some of the electrification projects that are happening at the port, you know, we like to hear when the drivers, you know, say, oh, we love this. We're not smelling diesel all day. It's a healthier environment. You know, those are all really good. That's really great feedback for us. We know that um, on a passenger vehicle, if you go from a conventional gasoline vehicle to an electric vehicle, um, the electric vehicle has one third of the moving parts of a gasoline vehicle. So there's less things that have to get done um, in maintenance. So to me, that's a big driver. Um, you know, when you're looking at a vehicle, all the things that could go wrong, now, you, you know, you have less of them to go wrong. So that's, you know, the similar things on a truck, on a medium and heavy duty truck. Um, so those are all big successes and all of that information is helpful. You know, like I said, we would love to hear those um, stories. We would love to hear, um, you know, anybody brag about this, um, the fuel savings. You know, there's a lot of savings that happens when you transition to an electric um, option. 
So I'm just going to go through some of the common questions um, that we've gotten. I'll give you the answers and then I'll open it up if anybody else has any further questions. Um, so that one of the biggest questions is local government. Who is local government? So I gave you some, um, you know, statutes there. So you can, um, if you want to look it up, but basically it's board of eds, um, colleges, municipalities, you know, anybody who you would really think. Um, but we've had some questions about quasi, from quasi government agencies like the Port Authority. They're not considered local government. Um, the next question is, you know, are only diesel vehicles available? I have propane vehicles, I have gasoline vehicles. Um, any alt fuel vehicles are eligible for our funding. Um, but like I had said before, and that gets to one of my other questions here is, you know, how we evaluate the projects. We will evaluate all the projects the same way using um, an EPA model. And we will take the fuel into account. And really what we're looking at is you know, the largest greenhouse gas reductions. Um, so the next question about, you know, can I replace a pickup? truck as part of this funding if it's owned by a local government. Um, right before this call, I had a question about police vehicles. Can they be, um, are they also eligible? Um, and the answer is yes, all those things are eligible. Um, but my bottom line answer is, you know, we're looking at the greatest greenhouse gas reductions. If I'm, re if I have a project to replace a pickup truck, and then I have a project to replace a garbage truck, um, you know, the emissions from a garbage truck are just that much greater. So just from the emission standpoint, um, that project will probably be ranked higher. But I don't want to discourage anybody from submitting um, a proposal. We get lots of funding from different sources. Um, all projects that come in, we do hold on to them if there's other funding. I like to go back to my um, pot of projects to see if we can fund them in another way. Um, it's just a matter of if you want to go ahead and do that work to submit that application. Um, but I do think you know there is value um, to doing that. Like I said in the past, we have gotten um, the authority to spend some of the Board of Public Utility money. So if that's the case and we have more projects, then um, it's possible to use other funding. Like I said. Okay, so the next um, couple of questions are um, again, like I said, private entities contracting with local government. Um, so private entities are allowed to submit as long as they have a contract with a local government. And that could be for um, garbage trucks, that could be for buses um, or any other applications. As long as there's a contract with a local government, they would be eligible. Um, there's no cap uh, or, you know, um, on the project for cost or amount of vehicles. Again, we're pay paying for that price differential between a new diesel and an electric. Um, what I think is really important here, and I say no matter what our solicitation is, um, if you're going to submit a project for a fleet of 20 school buses and you provide us all the budget information, what is really helpful to know is how is your project scalable? Um, you know, oftentimes we evaluate a number of different projects. You'll see that I have $6.8 million for this solicitation. If I have awarded up to $5 million or $5.5 million and I only have another million, but you're the, the next project that's seeing great emission reductions is $3 million and I don't have enough. Um, is that project scalable? And I can't go back and forth and have all these conversations with all um, you know, our applicants. It's really important if you can put on the grant agreement, how is your project scalable? Can I look at it and say, okay, well, they're applying for 20 vehicles. Um, their minimum that they would go with to make this project work, work is five vehicles. So what is the budget per vehicle? with a limit of, you know, our minimum would be five school buses, our maximum would be 20. So all of those things, if you can provide that, that really helps us when it comes time to decision making. There's been lots of times that we 
um, taken projects and we've cut them in half or we've reduced them, um, in our opinion, it's always better to give some funding um, and spread it around than to put all of our funding towards one project. Not to say that we go and slice and dice projects because we don't. Um, but if we see valuable emission benefits and in an area that we haven't seen any electrification, um, you know, I'd like to be able to make some decisions on how we might be able to modify a proposal just so we can award some funding there. Um, so yeah, making your project scalable and letting us know what that scale looks like is really important. Um, and then the last question here is about the scrappage. Like I said, the old vehicle must be decommissioned and rendered inoperable for you to get um, the reimbursements. We require pictures. We have um, detailed instructions of what needs to um, happen during that decommissioning process. Um, so that's a very important piece of this component uh, of this solicitation. Um, so then here I have some resources. Um, again, I guess my assumption is that this PowerPoint is going out. It will be posted somewhere. You can email me if um, I could always send it to you. But here's three different resources that I think would be really helpful. One, obviously, is the application. You can find it on our web page as well. It was in the link to our um, solicitation. The second thing is a resource for medium and heavy duty electrification options. Um, this is a really great resource. Once you go to the web page, basically it will show you, you know, you can look up, are you looking for a cargo uh, van? Are you looking for a box truck? Are you looking for, um, you know, an 18 wheeler truck or, you know, a garbage truck? You click on that and it will show you all the offerings from um, all the manufacturers. So that, you know, you'll know right away if the vehicle you want to replace, if there's an electric option. Um, you know, that is not a website that we maintain. It's one that we do reference and we go to a lot. Um, so I can't say that every vehicle out there is, is guaranteed on that website. Um, but I would be pretty certain to say, you know, anything that that website is being updated and utilized um, quite often. So that's a really good resource. Um, and then the third link I have here is to DEP's Overburden Community webpage that provides the map to give some guidance on the areas that we'd be looking at, where we would be giving priority to. Um, so that's just another tool to help you along with this solicitation. Um, and then the last thing is just um, my contact information. If you need to send me an email, um, feel free to send me an email, ask me questions. Um, you know, I'll leave that there for you guys to uh, jot down. But that's all the question. Uh, that's all the questions and answers that I have prepared. Um, but I'm willing to take any questions that might have come in through the chat. Well, besides that, let me ask a question before Christina gives us the chat questions. Uh, a lot of the municipalities uh, could forsake some. Let's go back to your example of like a three hundred thousand dollars school bus. And you have to, you actually only need a hundred thousand dollar diesel power thing. You have to come up with a hundred thousand dollars. A lot of municipalities you use like an improvement authority to avoid some of the five percent bonding or releasing the equipment instead. Would that still be able, the funding part for the municipality part be part of the decision making and how you uh, determine the grant application? So the decision never is really based on who's owning the vehicle or what the contracts or how you go through that. It's really based on where the project is located and the greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, good. All right. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> What we're learning with all of these projects for, you know, for many years, I did grant projects for um, construction equipment. So that's just very quick and easy. It's a construction company that owns a bunch of equipment. Once we move into the local government realm, especially school buses, that's like a whole nother animal. And we're <laughs> learning a lot about those contracts. So, you know, in the, in the beginning, we were, you know, stumbling through to try to make these projects work, but while understanding, um, how this works and every school district seems to have something um, a little bit different and um, municipal government does procure in many different ways so we're here to really try to um, try to make this easier of a process for everybody but yeah bear with us with um, 
some some of these nuances that are out there that we don't know about. And those vehicles are on the state list of buying from through the state contract, right? Or no? There are vehicles that are on a cooperative agreement. <clears throat> uh, we know municipalities like to go that way because it's much easier um, from a procurement side. I wouldn't say that all of them um, are on a cooperative agreement from our perspective when we do our grant agreements. If a municipality is not buying off of a cooperative agreement, we require three uh, quotes, price quotes for the vehicles. We don't specify who you choose. We just need to see three quotes. Um, you know, you may not go with the lowest bidder nor do you have to. You know, if, you know, quote A is higher than quote, you know, C, but A is who you have a supplier of other vehicles, you have a maintenance contract, or you have a good working relationship, that would be reason to go with um, quote A, and we're not gonna specify, you know, who you have to go with. We just need to see it for procurement sake to make sure that the prices are somewhat in line. You know, if one is extraordinarily much higher, we will question that if that's the one you wanna go with. But we're not in the business of telling anybody who they should be selecting. Thank you. Um, so this is actually the first time this has ever happened to us. We have four questions and they're all the same question. Everyone <laughs> wants to know who are the overburdened communities and how do we find out? Um, which I did see the link at the end of your presentation. So I will be sharing your presentation with everyone okay. that is on this uh, that is on this call that registered. Uh, and also, um, this will be um, sent out to our mailing list and, and to, um, to those that couldn't make it. So in the event that there are any questions, we will um, forward them to you as well, Melissa. And, you know, we thank you for that opportunity to uh, take the questions after the fact. We really appreciate that. Um, since there are no other questions in the chat, I'll give everyone one more second or two if, if you want to type them in very quickly. Uh, and I'm also, uh, you know, I can also expand on the overburden communities. Yes. Um, you know, so obviously it's a lot of the cities that people would think of, right? Trenton, Patterson, Camden, you know, but um, the overburden communities, I believe, I don't have the exact number, you know, that I think there's 565 municipalities in the state. I believe there's something like 340 overburden communities. And then within those overburden communities, we do prioritize some that, um, you know, are, you know, have a higher or an increased amount of census tracts within that community. Um, so we do prioritize, but, you know, again, like I said, because we have the ability to use funding from other places, if you have a really good project, you feel like your, you know, your municipality is ready to move forward with electrification. Um, I suggest everybody submit a proposal. Even if you don't get selected this time, we're, we're doing two solicitations a year for Reggie funding, for ZEP funds. Sometimes we're, you know, may, we share our applications with EDA and BPU. So it's a possibility that they might look at projects that we have in-house for funding. Um, there's a lot of federal funding that's coming down for electrification. Um, so there, like right now, like I said, it's a good time to be in the transportation world. There's a lot of funding coming from the feds um, as well as other agencies. So to me, it's really important just to show that you're interested. You, you've gone through that thoughtful process of what vehicles you would replace. Um, and like I said, it's that interest in being shovel ready and um, to, to submit an application. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, thank you again so much for, for joining us. And I look forward to seeing which projects are selected. It'll be very interesting to, to, to flee through them. Yeah, and again, any questions, feel free to send me an email. Um, and we also have our Stop the Site uh, email that I've been receiving questions through. Um, so feel free to reach out to us in any way. And thanks again for hosting this and giving me the opportunity to get, you know, some of our most commonly asked questions um, and answers to out there. Well, thank you, Melissa. I'll just add that keep Middlesex moving as your local TMA could probably help with some questions also and pass them on to you or at least get some answers that we know about. So 
so we can both work together and collaborate. Thank you for your help. Sounds Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you.